it is divided into similar segments, into segments that are similar to the segments of the vertebral column. From each segment, a spinal nerve emerges and is formed from two roots, that is a dorsal and a ventral root. The dorsal root of the spinal cord contains sensory or the afferent nerve fibers and it drains a ganglion containing sensory nerve bodies. While the ventral root has the dorsal and motor afferent neurons, the spinal cord serves as a link between the brain and the nerves from all over the body. That is, is the one that is that have as a link. Spinal cord is a link between the brain and the peripheral nervous system. The stimuli for reflex action are received in the dorsal ganglia and they are transmitted via neurons in the gray matter to the ventral motor neuron. The process involved in nerve impulse transmission. No. How does nerve, how is tra uh, nerve impulse transmitted? When the nerve endings of the receptor organ are stimulated, a nerve impulse is generated which is transmitted along the sensory or the afferent nerve from the receptor to the spinal cord through the dorsal roots by the chemical and electrical processes. So when you know, I said the receptor organs, for instance, the sense organ, your eyes, your hair, your skin, your nose, and the light. So when there is a stimulation of the nerve endings in these sense organs, there is a nerve impulse that is generated, and it is transmitted along the sensory nerve to the receptor of the spinal cord through the dorsal roots by chemical or electrical processes. Now, in the spinal cord, the impulse is relayed through a synapse into the intermediate neuron. That's the connector neuron now. Then through another synapse, that's, you know, I said synapse is a space between two nerve cells or two neurons. So, through another synapse, now we have, we've had a neuron, we have, we've had a synapse. That is, the impulse is relayed from one nerve cell to another through a synapse, that's a space between the two nerve cells into the intermediate neuron. Then we have another synapse, the impulse is now carried by the motor or the efferent nerve which passes through the, nerve, um, the ventral root of the motor, motor or effector organ which responds to the stimulus. Then a chemical such as acetylcholine carries the nerve impulse across the synapse. So, by the time there is a, 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 a nerve, the nerve ending of the receptor organ, say your sense organ, is stimulated, is there, there is a nerve impulse that is generated. Maybe there is something that happens to your eyes or your nose, you perceive something before it is interpreted. The processes that is involved is what I just mentioned. It is carried through a series of process before you can, before the brain, it, it actually gets to the spinal cord of the brain that interprets it for you. Now, the mechanism of transmission of nerve impulse, when the nerve endings of the receptor organ are stimulated, a nerve impulse is generated and transmitted along the axon by the chemical processes of the next nerve fiber. In between the two nerve fibers is a space, I mentioned that, called the synapse, through which nerve impulses are transmitted by chemicals called neurotransmitters, such as acetylcholine. The transmission of impulses along the nerve fibers is characterized by changes in the electrical potential and the ionic charge. When the axon is at rest, the outside is positive and the inside is negatively charged. This is known as the resting potential when the outside is positive and the inside is negatively charged. This state is known as the resting potential. Then the membrane surrounding the axon is said to be polarized. That is, it can maintain different electric charge on its two sides, both inside and outside. That's why we say it is polarized. Positive inside, negatively charged outside. Now, potassium ions are concentrated inside the fiber and sodium ions on the outside, 
Potassium ions are concentrated inside the fibers, then sodium ions are on the outside. When the fiber is stimulated, there is a change in the permeability of the cell membrane. The sodium ion moves in and the potassium ion moves out of the cell. Such or uh, sodium reverser now in the resting potential which accompanies the impulse. The inside then becomes positive and the outside becomes negative. And that is where we have the action potential. When the outside is positive and the inside is negative, that is when we have the resting potential. But when the reverse is the case, that is the inside becoming positive and the outside becoming negative, we have what we call the action potential. This change in the ionic charge along the fiber causes the movement of electrical currents along the fiber, thus impulse is transmitted. The resting potential is restored as soon as the impulse is passed on. And it has been shown that after the passage of an impulse, there is an absolute refractory period during which no stimulus, however strong, can excite the nerve to conduct an impulse. And it lasts about 3 milliseconds. So after an impulse has been transmitted, there is a rest, there is a kind of resting stage now that no impulse is transmitted no matter how strong and it just lasts about 3 milliseconds. Now, following this um, rest or refractive period, it's called refractive period because we have what we call resting potential and action potential before. So this, after this refractive period, there is the ref relative period when nerve fiber can be excited now providing the stimulus intensity stronger than usual. Then the refractive period therefore determines the frequency at which an exon can transmit an impulse. So after an impulse has been transmitted, the refractive period is the period of no stimulus transmission. So the refractive period therefore is the one that determines the frequency, that is the rate at which an exon transmits and impulse. We'll be talking about the types of nervous action and basically we'll be talking about the reflex and the voluntary action. First, I'll be talking about the reflex or the involuntary action. Reflex action or an, is an involuntary action and it is a rapid, innate, automatic response to a stimulus which does not involve the brain for its initiation. I said that you don't think about it. It's something that is when I said in it, it is like it is inborn. Yes, it is just natural with you. You don't think about it before you do it. That is what is called a reflex or an involuntary action. For this action to be accomplished, the nerve cells must receive impulse from the receptors and in turn hand them on to the effectors. And examples of reflex or involuntary action, we have the blinking of the eye. You know, sometimes maybe something wants to touch your eye or something just blink the eye. Your knee jack sometimes just feel a force like a sound in your knee, you just jack. You don't do that yourself. Then salivation, maybe while you are sleeping, sneezing is not something you just talk about, you just discover that you sneeze, coughing, secretion of glands, those are examples of reflex or involuntary action. A reflex act is the nervous pathway along which impulses travel from the receptor to the effector. In a reflex action, in order to bring about a response. So the path that uh, uh, the reflex act is the pathway by which impulse uh, travel from receptor to the effector, from where it receives the impulse to where it is actually performing that action. That is what is called the reflex act, and we have it as this: from the receptor, it goes to the sensor neuron or the sensory neuron, then to the intermediate neuron. Then we have the neuron in the central nervous system. Then it comes to the motor neuron, then to the effector organ. So that, this is a reflex act. Receptor to sensory neuron, intermediate neuron. We have neuron in the central nervous system, the motor neuron, then the effector organ. A simple reflex involves one receptor and one effector. But a complex reflex involves a number of neurons and their effectors, or a number of receptors and their effectors. If nerve impulse is carried directly to the spinal cord and back again without passing through the brain, that is, a nerve impulse is 
carried directly to the spinal cord and is carried back again without passing through the brain, we call that a spinal reflex because it involves the spinal cord. So it is called a spinal reflex. The brain is not involved in that reflex at all. Now, here the reflex action is relayed mainly through the brain instead of through the spinal cord. We call it a cranial reflex. That's brain. A reflex action that involves the brain instead of through the spinal cord is called the cranial reflex. Now, voluntary or self-initiated actions. This is, this is a response to a stimulus that is controlled as will by the brain. So voluntary action is not something that you just do without knowing about it. It is controlled by the brain and is a response to a stimulus that has occurred. An impulse is carried from a sensory neuron to the spinal cord, then to the brain, which interprets and directs the message back through the motor neuron to the effector organ. So it involves a, a, a process. It's not something that just happens without your consent, so to say. All the actions that we think about before we do them, such as you write, running, jumping, smiling, typing, reading, are voluntary actions. They are all voluntary actions because you talk about them before you do them. So you, that those are voluntary actions. Now, another one is a conditioned reflex or response. A conditioned reflex or response. This is not a reflex action in, 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 in per se, but it is conditioned. A learning is a learning process or a learning response.